All right, ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the Tiger Pit is brought to you by Athlon Rub. Athlon Rub is the next generation in performance and recovery for all sports. It is a new approach on the traditional Thai oil formula, founded on the time-tested formula and enhanced to proven ingredients. Made in an FDA and ISO certified lab in the USA, certified and continually tested by Informed Choice to be free of banned substances, PEDs, and cross-contamination. You can go to athlonrub.com and take a look at all the products they have available, read testimonials from users, and see what everybody else is saying. And when you got some things in your cart, get an additional 10% off when you use the promo code the Tiger Pit. That's athlonrub.com and promo code the Tiger Pit for an additional 10% off all the cool stuff you're gonna buy. We are also brought to you by Knock My Legends. Knock My Legends celebrates the heroes, legends, and icons of Muay Thai and kickboxing. Their mission is to create art in the form of apparel that honors each fight contribution to the sport and the art we love. They also have a great selection of shirts, gear, and accessories that highlight the greats from the sport from the past up until today. You can go to knockmylegends.com that's N-A-K-M-U-A-Y legends.com as well as Facebook and Instagram and check out what they have and when you're ready to buy something, you're at checkout enter the promo code the Tiger Pit for an additional 10% off your purchase. Again, that's knockmylegends.com N-A-K-M-U-A-Y legends.com or Knock My Legends on Facebook and Instagram. This episode also brought to you by Diplomatico Rum. Diplomatico is distributed in over 80 countries around the world. It holds the Ron de Venezuela DOC and is recognized as one of the world's finest rums. They have three different ranges for your tastes, traditional, prestige, and the distillery collection. You can find them online at rondiplomatico.com. That's Ron, R-O-N, which means rum in Spanish. Anyways, it's rondiplomatico.com to learn more about who they are and find out some history behind one of the world's greatest rums. We are also brought to you by Unplugged Essentials. Hemp is at the core of their innovation. However, not all hemp is created equal. Instead of using either isolated CBD or cannabis oil, which are the most popular cannabis-derived products on the market right now, they have infused their soaps with a water-soluble, hemp-derived, phytocannabinoid-rich powder. This way, they make sure that all their products take advantage of the several hundred bioactive components present in hemp. They also make no compromise in quality to ensure each batch is lab-tested and 100% THC free. You can find them on Instagram and Facebook or go to unpluggedfloatessentials.com and get yours today. And you can use the promo code THETIGERPIT at checkout for an additional 10% off your order. That's Unplugged Essentials on Instagram and Facebook and unpluggedfloatessentials.com online. And like I said, use the promo code THETIGERPIT for 10% off your order. All right, and this is for our New York friends and listeners here. Um, We are also brought to you by the Stepping Razor Barbershop at 952 Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. The Stepping Razor leans into the realm of the classic 1940s American barbershop. They specialize in American classic traditional haircuts and shaves, but are versatile and can do much, much more. You can check them out on Instagram at the Stepping Razor Barbershop or go to the steppingrazor.com to book your appointment and get yourself looking good and feeling good. And lastly, we are brought to you by the Dojo NYC at 1082 Cypress Avenue in Ridgewood. The Dojo NYC is a fully equipped martial arts training center specializing in Cobrinha Jiu Jitsu, traditional Muay Thai, and MMA. Whether you want to go and just get a good workout or compete at a high level, it's a great place to train. You can also go to the dojonyc.com and check out their classes, instructors, programs, and even sign up for a free trial class, which hopefully after you do that, you'll sign up for more and keep going and get better at jujitsu, Muay Thai, whatever it is you're going for. That's dojonyc.com online and the Dojo NYC on Instagram. All right. Our guest on this episode was born in Beirut. He was a big part of the New York City music scene until he relocated to New Orleans in 2016. I met him at a session in 2010 and we became quick friends. Along with playing guitar on the majority of my productions, he shared the stage and recorded with giants such as Alan Toussaint, Taj Mahal, Harry Belafonte, Angelique Cujo, Sean Cootie, Damien and Julian Marley, Corey Henry, and many, many more. 
We recorded this episode on May 18th. It was our first attempt at a remote podcast. So that being said, would you please welcome to the Tiger Pit, Mr. Raja Cassis. On the next episode of Adventures in Animals. It's a Kavarian and a Polish guy. Okay, we'll start the podcast right here. It's 9 o'clock. It's dark enough. I'm putting on my ninja suit. That's the part, right? You gotta get into your head. Now you're struggling with your words. Check the Yelp reviews. I'm sure they have like four. It's amazing. I was trying to get that out, and I had a hard time struggling in my head. They just see something they don't recognize, they check out immediately. I had a point. I had a point. Coming to the stage. I've heard this many times from different sources. You didn't even know me when I was hanging out there. That sounds like such a burnout thing to do. Tiger Pit. <laughs> Should be Somebody honest. screenshot this. Little disclaimer. <laughs> little disclaimer. This is not my first one. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, that, uh, I trust that. Cheers, motherfuckers. <laughs> Cheerios. Cheers. All right. Well, this also <laughs> isn't my last one of the mm-hmm. day either. We got a whole podcast to do. Mm-hmm. All right. And we got Raja on, so we got the furnace burning. Yes, sir. So, what's up, man? You living your best Corona life or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm here in my little, um, my little cubicle, um, doing my prison workouts and. Yep. You know. I hear that. Yeah, for real. <laughs> That's pretty much what it is. I'm yeah, jumping man. rope like I never have before. I guess it took a pandemic for us to finally do this shit, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You well, got you know, me. <laughs> we tried to get you in the la- the last time when you were in when you did the the Harry Belafonte show, but you were you were a working man and you were on the clock. You had responsibilities. So. I, w- I was a little wrapped up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. I was so bummed. I was like, "Oh, he's in town. Get him in here, man!" <laughs> oh man, it was like fucking. Uh, that was like four days of dress rehearsal and shit. So you know, how how was that? It was, I mean, it was amazing. It was one hell of a way to play a last show before this shit started. I'll tell you that much. No doubt. Hell yeah. But yeah, I mean, basically it was, yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of those, I'll put it this way. My parents came to the show. Oh, cool. Cool. <laughs> okay. Cool. You know, the Apollo. Yeah. And um, that's awesome. Especially Harry's history with that. And, and obviously the lineup of musicians, you know, um, yep. I still, I still really haven't processed that one. You know, mm. and you you played with Angelique uh, Kijo, right? With yeah, that, well, on that I was show? in the house band that we backed up all the artists. So, oh, uh, all the artists. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it was uh, Alice Smith, Aloe Black, Angelique Kijo. I'm reading the poster on my wall. <laughs> uh, ba- um, based on based comments. on your Instagram photos, I thought you were just backing her up. No, 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 no. I was in the house band doing the whole show. So got it, um, got it, we backed right. up Common. Um, amazing artist called Guy Alfai from uh, France. Um, John Forte, if you know him from the food yeah, news background. Yeah, yeah. What's up with that dude? Um, he's he's rocking, man. He's he's been a friend of mine for almost a decade now. Um, and uh, we did a little touring out in uh, Warsaw, Poland. Uh huh. And uh, that was like probably like eight or nine years ago. But he he's just like a really heavy motherfucker. Like that guy lyrically. Musically, spirit-wise, he's he's one of my. Favorites. I know he's dope. You just, I just, you hadn't, I hadn't heard from him uh, in such a long time. Well, he went to prison, you know. No, I know this. Yeah, yeah. On some fucked up, you know, you know, white America bullshit. I think. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know. But he's 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 grinding hard. He's doing his thing. I gotta hear. I want to hear some because I liked him back then. I just didn't hadn't heard anything from. Yeah, man. From I mean, he, here, he's know? got a he's got a bunch of releases um, that have happened recently. Um, a lot of it's like really like kind of folky, and he plays acoustic guitar and sings and rhymes and uh, you know it's um, it's definitely not what you would expect from his you know um, his resume. But um, it's it's really dope stuff. But uh, who else was there? Talib Kweli. Um, oh, say okay. We actually did a uh, with Talib. It was Talib, John Forte, and Aloe Black, um, all on the same song. Okay, so that's kind of like big time Brooklyn history right there. Yeah, mm-hmm. sweet man. That sounds like a great gig, man. A mighty sparrow. I got to play with the nice, sparrow, nice. man. I saw that too. <laughs> Eighty nine cool, years man. old, man, and he was like, still kicking, right? Listen, man, it's it's such a crazy story because I mean, if you know Calypso music, you know he's the king of Calypso. Um, yeah. But about two and a half years ago, he had a stroke and he was in a coma, and mm-hmm. you know he's not young, but he came out of that shit. He came out 
Um, he has a little problem walking now, you know, for understandable reasons, but um, uh, mentally he's sharp as a tack, man. And he was like, he had the crowd in stitches, like saying these jokes and like, you know, <laughs> he always had a beef with Harry Belafonte back in the day because, you know, the record industry was uh, calling Harry the King of Calypso, but he wasn't from, like he wasn't born in Jamaica, which a lot of people don't really put together. He was born in Harlem. He was a Harlem kid. And then went really? back and forth a lot when um, his uh, his father was a chef on the United Fruit Company boat, you know, the shipping boat that would go from the Caribbean to uh, New York City. So he would be going back and forth. And then, he, you know, he was fucking up as a kid. He was like pretty rebellious motherfucker. And um, so they put him on a boat with his dad and dropped him off with his grandma in Jamaica. And that's where you uh-huh. know, he spent like five or six years. So. Um, That'll do it. But Harry was never comfortable with being called the King of Calypso. It was always something that really bothered him. And so he made it a point. He's like, no matter what, if we're doing my birthday show, you got to bring the sparrow and you got to introduce him as the true King of Calypso, which was like super fucking, you know, I mean, I'm there. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's cool. We did Gene and Dinah. It was like, you know, that's the classic right there. Um, That's dope, man. Who else was there? Sheila E. was there. Uh, Sheila E. and Angelique performed together. Um, Maxwell was supposed to be there, and he canceled uh, a day before the show because he had – he lost his voice, basically. He was sick, and he lost his voice. Like, he literally – some people were like, oh, he's being a diva, you know, what? No, not for Harry. Like, people, like, stand up straight when – fucking Harry yeah, Belafonte right. calls you, you know? <laughs> That's not a gig you... you nah, just nah, man, you know, you'll get some shit for that. So, you know, he legit had to cancel. So Usher stepped in, and that was great. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's great. Um, did you have much interaction with Harry during this, or what was that like? Well, um, for this show, no, but my relationship with Harry started... Um, oh, you knew him previously? Yeah, well, you know, when you say know him, that's like, you know, that's, You've worked with like him, I'm right? not, I'm not like, hey, got him on speed dial, like calling him, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but basically, um, a very good friend of mine. I'm coming named, over. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a, a very good friend of mine um, named Brian Satz, who was actually the original bass player for Blitz the Ambassador and all that touring I did with that back in the day. Um, long story short, basically has become, you know. Um, one of Harry's managers. I'm not sure exactly what the title is, but basically he's, he's with him like every day. And, um, Brian's a amazing musician and a dear friend. And, uh, just from years of, you know, playing fucked up Brooklyn shows for no money and like, you know, all that stuff. Um, we remained, uh, friends and, um, and basically that was my connection with him. So about four or five years ago, he calls me out of the blue. He's like, hey, man, are you in New York? And I had just moved to New Orleans. So I was like, ah, man, yeah, not, mm, I don't know. Maybe. What do you need me for? <laughs> you know? And um, he's like, I got this recording session. I was like, cool, man. Um, <clears throat> you know, how much does it pay? <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, and I almost, you know, usually you're not supposed to ask that right out the bat because that's kind of like a bad move, I guess. But he's my boy. So I, I figured I'd ask. And, you know, he gave me a figure that was workable and i was like so what is it for and he's like oh this is a session for harry belafonte i was like oh (laughs) um when's the date he's like uh it's like in six days can you be here i was like no problem (laughs) leaving now (laughs) now here here here's where the story gets really fucking crazy is in all my years of touring in all my years of playing gigs, everything, anything that has ever required me to be on time, as in making a flight, um, uh-huh. I've never missed a flight. I've never been late for a flight. It's just how I roll. When I have a flight, I go to the airport like four hours early. You know, yeah. I, that's you, just how, around. you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. You know, because basically I can't afford to. <laughs> <laughs> to I can't afford to get another right. ticket. You, you know, right it's not it's not because I'm such a great guy. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> 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 I was just broke ass musician, man. Fuck it. You know, that's my history with like how I roll going to an airport and all this stuff. So um, it's a red eye flight. Um, I think the flight time is like 6 a.m. So I get there, you know, my usual like 3 a.m., 3 30, whatever. I get there plenty of time, all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, cool, no problem. 
um, you know, I'm hungry as a motherfucker. Let me go get some, uh, let me get some grub. So, um, I go to the, the, uh, restaurant in there that was like a real deal, New Orleans run, you know, operation, real red beans and rice. And, you know, it's like legit stuff. They had some breakfast stuff going on. So I was like, cool. So I'm in there and, um, they're taking a long time and, you know, it's New Orleans. People are, are just more relaxed in general. And which, you know, I really trust that situation nine times out of 10. But, you know, it's taking that extra long time. And I was like, okay, um, I get my food. I'm, I'm doing that. And I, I see out the corner of my, my gate. And um, I realize there's nobody sitting at the gate. And then at, at that point, I get a little nervous. And, and I chuck down my food. And, and I go over to the gate. And I'm walking up. And the two attendants are, like, kind of looking at me weird. And I get there. And I start getting a bad feeling. I'm like, um. And they're like, oh, baby, it's gone. Oh, man. Your flight is gone. I was like, now this is on the same day of the session, which is happening oh. at noon. And it is 6 a.m. in New Orleans, which means it's 7 a.m. in New York. Oh, my God. So I start freaking out. I'm like, you know, number one, I have no experience with missing a flight. <laughs> so I don't know what to do. Number right. two, I, I'm just start. I get the cold sweats. I'm like, I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, I need to get like, I need to get to New York now. Like. When is the next flight? They're like, the next flight out of here is like in an hour, but it transfers in Charlotte and there's no guarantee you're going to get on a flight. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I was like, uh, I don't know. And at the time, I just happened to be like super fucking broke. So I'm like, I'm looking at potentially being stranded in Charlotte. Like, <laughs> you know, like, you know mm -hmm. no way to get in or out if I can't get out of there in time. Right. And, you know, this session is only for one day. It starts at noon. I'm like, whatever, fuck it. So I get on that next flight, which is like a couple hours later, I land in Charlotte and, you know, cold sweats all the time. I'm having like, you know, I'm just like, did I just fuck up like one of the biggest <laughs> opportunities in my life? <laughs> you know, all these things are going through my head and I get to Charlotte and the next, um, the next flight is like leaving right at, you know, basically landing at noon in New York. And, you know, Charlotte is a major hub. So I start, I'm like, okay, I got to get on that. I'm just going to have to explain to them why I'm late. And, you know, it's going to take another hour for me to get from JFK to the, the studio in Brooklyn and all this stuff. And um, so I just start walking around and I see another gate with New York JFK on it, leaving an hour earlier. And I just walk up and I'm like, listen, I got a situation on my hands. I need some help. I need, I need to like, is there any room on this flight? The lady climbingly looks at her computer and she's like, yeah, we got you. Get on. Nice. The universe was looking nice. out for your ass right there. <laughs> yeah. I landed literally, I think, like 20 minutes before the session. I ran outside the airport, jumped in a fucking cab, and I arrived like 12.01. Wow. Nice. I was going to say, you landed an acceptable 20 minutes maybe late. Wow. Right. And guess what? Everyone else was an hour late. So, hey. Right on. Cheers. <laughs> that, Tales from the road, you know. That's a great story. Was the gig? When was the gig from that day? <laughs> um, the gig uh, for that day? From that session, you were there for a gig, right? You did a session before? No, no, no. It, it was a recording session. Oh, it was a recording session. Okay. Yeah. What What a lot of people don't realize is that Harry can't sing anymore. He lost. He always had a gravelly voice. Sure. 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 Um, if you read his autobiography, it's actually an amazing read um i highly recommend it it's called my song harry okay. belafonte okay and you know he talks about like losing his voice early because he never learned how to sing properly he wanted to be an actor i can relate and his uh best friend growing up was Sidney Poitier. long story short they both became to be the two most famous african-americans in american entertainment and pretty much the whole world at a certain point once they made it but harry always wanted to be an actor mm -hmm. so he never knew how to sing mm -hmm. but he would always hang at the jazz clubs and um when i say hang at the jazz clubs he was hanging with lesser young charlie parker um mm -hmm. bud powell like all the fucking guys but he never got the training to be a singer so you know trained singers sing from their stomach mm -hmm. but he was singing from his throat and so early on, he developed like very, you know, losing his voice a bunch. And back in those days, they had some real interesting treatments for that. And there was this one German doctor that all the celebrities were going to. They're like, oh, you lost your voice? Go to this guy. He's got this magic pill that, you know, you take and it's like amazing. And it was an injection into your throat. Oh, God. This steroid. 
Jesus. Which, sure enough, the next day he woke up and his voice was perfect. He was like, oh my God, I don't But he it did really it a few times and he started to realize like, yo, there's, you know, nothing's too good to be true. Like, this does not seem right. Yeah. And he got off of it, but he found out later that a lot of other celebrities got hooked on this shit and it like probably killed somebody or, you know, it was, it was like, so fast forward to, to, uh, when he's, uh, 94 years old, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I hear that singing from the throat, man. I mean, I sing from my from my throat too, and I fuck up my voice every time we've had a gig. And Bill used to yell at me all the time. He's like, "You gotta sing like Santa Claus." Yeah, <laughs> you gotta sing from your belly, sing like Santa Claus, man. And I'm like, I don't fucking know. I'm singing up here, and everything. I just like, ah, oh, it's like I get all amped, and everything yeah. comes from here. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, fast forward the first time, the time of the session, he was 89 actually. Um, and so he had, he had completely lost his ability to sing. He talks with a very gravelly voice, which is super badass. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, but, uh, yeah. but, um, I guess the point of the story, oh yeah. The point of the story is that a lot of people don't realize he never stopped producing and his mind is still sharp as a motherfucking tack. Like this guy, you know, and you dig into his civil rights history and like all this stuff, this guy yeah, yeah, is I know like that, yeah. unbelievable mm-hmm. human mm-hmm. being, man. I mean, he's an amazing human. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's what I was really interested in when I asked you how much your interaction was with him. I, w- I was basically going to ask you, like, yo, how dope of a human being is he in person? Like, he must, his energy must just be so, like, yeah, you're in the presence of greatness. <laughs> you know, he's like a great dude. It is mm-hmm. a very, very strong presence, man. Yeah, like he walks in the so. room and it's like everybody shuts up. Yeah, I would believe that. This is one of Martin Luther King's best friends. You know, it's like yeah. you know, but um. Like he never mm-hmm. stopped producing, and um, this was for a project that he was working with some people I can't talk about, but you know, because uh, it's not released yet. But basically, in that session, I had a lot of interaction with him, and he, I, you know, I'm still learning things about him as a producer. Like he would say, really, you know, he had us all in a room, and we'd play a take, and then he would stop. He'd be like, you go to someone random, he'd point at me, and he'd be like, how'd you feel about that? And I'm like, uh, 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 <laughs> like shit, because I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, but, but, um, uh, you know, and I was like, well, you know, I hear what I'm going for, but it's just not coming out or, you know, whatever. He would do all these little, like seemingly insignificant questions by the end of that. I'm, like, I'm still realizing shit that he would say in a very insignificant way. But this guy was actually the very first million selling record with Dale. It was the first oh. record anywhere in the world to sell exactly one million copies. And it sold a lot more, obviously. Um, and so when it comes to producing and everything, this guy just, you know, he just knows. He knows these secret things. And he's, mm-hmm. I think because he's a little bit removed from being like a cat, you know, um, like he doesn't know how to read or write music. He did, you know, never learned an instrument properly, whatever. But he just knows, he looks at it from the outside and he knows the sound and, uh, sure enough, he gets results, man. Even even to this day, you know. But yeah. for the for the show at the Apollo, I mean, it was so mm-hmm. crazy. Basically, we had finished four straight days of about twelve to fifteen hour dress rehearsals, and the last dress rehearsal was in the Apollo the day of the show. And so we're just like exhausted, man. We're just like, you know, just been, you know, through the washing machine, man. And um, and so we finally get all our stuff set and we run all the songs and everything with the with the artists who come in with their managers or musical directors or whatever. And um, and basically, I was one of the last ones off the stage, um, you know, just making sure my lines are correct and everything like that. And I'm walking off and then all of a sudden I realize Harry Belafonte is in his wheelchair right there. And every celebrity that's on the bill is around him like common talib everyone's like yo mr balafonte thank you so much da, 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 da. and i you know i wanted to i wanted to go up there because you know honestly it's like i really wanted a picture with him because you know my mom had a crush on him in the 60s and you know and like other shit you know <laughs> which I my dad doesn't like kid, you know yeah. but um yeah, he's, he's I yeah he's, he's oh amazing. i mean my whole family loved him too he was like such a i don't know he was his his music was so digestible to so many different types of people too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think a lot of people miss that because there are a lot of people that kind of look at him as this gimmick, you know, like, Hey, welcome really? to the islands and da da da. But oh, he, right. he always, yeah. he always fought that shit. 
They tried yeah. the record labels tried to put him on a on an album cover with a banana headdress on. He was like, mm. "Fuck you," you know, like yeah. like for real, man. But but even at I guess he's a uh, what was his birthday party? It was his 93rd birthday party on March 1st. And at 93, he is, as a very straight man, he is a great looking guy. <laughs> like, even at 93. <laughs> he's, he's still yeah, he was I mean, always he's, a good looking guy. He's still sure. got everything man. together, man. He was always crisp. He got good skin, everything. Just, he's br- like, he shines, you know what I'm saying? Like, everything is like, he's like a radiant person. He, he, he was very blessed, mm-hmm. man. I don't know what, yeah. <laughs> what kind of genes he got, man, but, you know, he's. <laughs> It, you know, but it, it, you know, overall, that's, you know, that's probably like a top five show I've ever done in my life. Man. Amazing. Good for you. That's I was great. very lucky that my friend Brian Sats called me and that we stayed in touch through all these years. And and um, I just feel very grateful to have been in the room, let alone play guitar. The craziest part about that musically was that the show was MD'd by Michael Bearden. That's Michael Jackson's last musical director. Michael who? Yeah, so if you watch that movie, the last, uh, you know, the last... I don't know uh, that guy. <laughs> yeah, and actually, he was the one playing all the keys parts, you know, from Thriller and all that stuff for Mike's show when he died. So that documentary, you know, that was made when they were rehearsing and then he passed away, that last documentary, he's mm-hmm. all up in that. But Michael Bearden, man, he's another kind of hairy kind of guy where, <clears throat> you know, basically, like, there was just little... Subtle shit. And this is the guy who, like, musically directs the orchestra for the Emmys and the Oscars. And uh, mm-hmm. he's Lady Gaga's, one of Lady Gaga's musical directors. You know, this is as big as it gets, you know. But he's mm-hmm. he's just got the magic, mm-hmm. man. He's just got the magic. You can't, it, it's like real subtle shit where it's like, you know, in a room full of, like, 25 people trying to get a show together. If he, you know, he knew how to crack the whip when he needed to and he knew how to be very diplomatic when he needed to too but yeah there was no doubt there was only one musical director in that room good captain (laughs) (laughs) that's what it takes man yeah that's yeah that's what you Mm -hmm. need that's what okay so that's that's part one which means i need another sip of my jameson Mm. oh we're okay we're going down like this huh (laughs) story time story time with raja (laughs) <laughs> hey you asked for it man i did <laughs> man I, i'm only disappointed because i got all these multicolored lights in here man it's like my studio's okay. <laughs> it could be it could we be messed you up with the background <laughs> yeah no but the background's dope man i'm like a hologram i come in i come out <laughs> fucking technology uh, boy. down the hatch cheers gentlemen Cheers. It's fantastic to see you guys. I miss you guys. And, you know, this actually, yeah, man. Likewise. likewise, man. I don't know. You know, it's like I'm, I don't like doing FaceTime. I don't like doing all that. Like when someone calls me, it's like, man, I could be just getting up. Like I could have like no shirt on. Like, you know, what? like, <laughs> like, like I don't I, like but how much I don't more FaceTime like have you that. done during this shit? <laughs> right. Right. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't like to do that stuff usually, but. Me neither, but right I have now, FaceTime. Right now, this is really nice, like, seeing my homies. Is it? <laughs> it really is, man. I'm telling you, I, I, I have FaceTime so many more of my friends, and everybody has the same reaction after. Like, usually they're like, man, I'm not going to lie. This is pretty cool, man. It's good, it's good hanging out. It's good hanging out. I mean, with the exception of me and Bill. Me and Bill do this shit all fucking time. This is oh, like, God, this is like nothing. <laughs> you know? This dude, will, this dude will hit me up. Like, be like 1130 at night. Yo. You want to have a shot with me? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> okay. And that turns into a two-hour conversation. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. You know? But well, I love catching up with, like, like just family, cousins of mine, like, friends of mine. I'll hit people mm-hmm. up that I have, you know, just checking in on them. We talk for an hour, hour and a half, catch up on things, have a drink with each other. And it just, it just makes you feel good just to see everybody and reconnect with everybody. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I mean, we ain't, we in the bunker, man. We really are. We really yeah, are, for real. Man. Man. Fucking almost two, Yo, it, it's like two months already, right? It's it's got me uh, actually answering my phone. Like, I, I know. You I know, know man. <laughs> Fucking miracle. God damn it, Billy. <laughs> Billy, I need a mix right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, uh, Raj, I want to ask you, how long have you been in New Orleans now? Man, you know what? It's like five and a half years, maybe almost six. Really? Mm. Yeah. I don't know how that happened either, man. Oh, um, shit. If I had to guess, I, was, I thought it was like two years ago or something. 
It's been five years. Well, let me ask you. How, we're kind of in the same boat. We're like in and out of New York, in and out of New York all the time. I'm, I, I'm in, I'm in Brooklyn weekly before the pandemic, obviously. Uh, weekly for about four days a week. If you're, you're doing the same thing with music, and you're coming in for gigs, doing your thing. How do you feel after having been in New York City for so long, and now having like one foot in, one foot out? How does, how do you feel about that? Well, you know. Um, it's really crazy, man, because when I first moved down here, the reason I moved out, a lot of people ask me the reason, like, why, how yeah. could you move yeah. to New Orleans? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. basically, I had done about what, 12 years in New York, and um, I was on the road pretty much eight months of the year for like the last three, four years I was in New York. Mm -hmm. And every time, you know, I was living in Bed-Stuy um, in this amazing brownstone place that I'd been living in for over 10 years and every time i came off a flight and got off the kingston troop stop on the c train i'd be walking around i'm like man i don't recognize this fucking neighborhood anymore you know it was just changing so rapidly every time you were gone and stuff right <laughs> right but like not in a good way mm. like in the way where there was a lot of fucking clueless ass people not connected to the culture i understand that, that i see were that walking That's around Mm -hmm. um, which really pisses me off because I was there for the culture, mm -hmm. you know. Um, That's and... not what it's about now. Not there now. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> no, no. The other... Yeah. But that even that wasn't the reason I had moved out. The reason was because I was just at a point in my life where I just needed a change, man. Um, I wasn't getting better musically. I wasn't shedding like I usually, you know what I mean? I don't believe that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but, but yeah, man, I, you know, I just came for me personally that I needed a change. But more than that, it's like, because I travel so much, I've never subscribed to one city. Okay. And I don't okay. think it's in a musician, like a touring musician's interest to do that. Like mm. I have uh, specifically you know, um, intentionally tried to set up little markets for myself in multiple cities, whether it's LA or Nashville or New Orleans or New York. Um, even if it's just like, you know, one club I play and I know the guy or something like that. It's like, you know, the, the economic system that's um, what it's done to music <laughs> is that it's taken our product away, you know? Yeah, so, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I got to make my own product and one city, it's not... You know, if you're just doing music like I am and you're, you know, playing music in clubs and stuff and touring and that's your main bread and butter, <clears throat> one city ain't going to hold you, man. Right. Especially New York. That's a good man. answer. I, I, that's, I like that. Yeah. I, I, I get you. You know, this last trip to New York, something really crazy just hit me like a ton of bricks, man. I was like, New York is still my home, man. You know, I hadn't felt it in a long time, but it was, like, I think, in conjunction with, like, that kind of show. But I was there for, like, 10 days, and, you know, I would picked up a couple of gigs with, like, Chauncey and Josh. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And um, Shout out to both of them. Yeah, yeah. Shout, shout out to the out homies. Shout out to Josh Warner. The homies. The lord of bass. The lord of the low end. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, basically, um, you know, it, it just felt real old school. It felt like old New York again. You know, I had yeah. my people. I was playing with my people, like, Hung it, hung uh, out at uh, New Blue until like four in the morning. Nice. And one nice. night, you know, it, it just all came back. Saw all my people, you know. I mean, New York City is notorious for doing that, though. If yeah. you leave, it when you visit back again, it it the claws sink in deep, and it yeah. gets the nostalgic claws and the love claws. It just gets in there, man. It's yeah. like and you're like. It makes you. It doesn't make you second guess, but it definitely makes you be like, "Oh man, I love this motherfucking city." That's why you you know so many stories of so many people leaving and they come back. I mean, right, that is right. notorious, man. It's like yeah, like, and I think I think only a real New Yorker can understand that. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Definitely, hundred percent. We're our own kind of people, man. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not for everybody. It, that's for sure. Oh no way! You seen that city spit so many people out, man? Who, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I've seen people when, crumble, man. Just shoo, yeah, with their tail between their legs, man. Yep, That's yep right. Yep, you can't handle yep. it. You can't handle the truth. No <laughs> doubt, hundred percent. 
Hundred percent. No, that's cool. So New Orleans has been treating you nice, I'm sure, man. Right? I mean, that's a wonderful city. Yeah, man. I mean, there's a there's only one New Orleans, just like there's only one New York. You know, uh-huh. um, mm-hmm. so there's a there's a thread going there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, man. Overall, New Orleans has given me a lot, man. Just I mean, it's a musician city too. You know. Yeah. Um, but you know, like any place, man. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly, man. Yeah. And yeah. I will say, there's two New Orleans, man. There's you know the New Orleans people come down for Jazz Fest and Mardi Gras and all that, but then there's the real New Orleans, and yeah. there's a lot of problems, man. Yes, right, right. There's a lot of problems, you know, and and there's certain parts of New Orleans that are you know like the third world, man, quote unquote. I hate that term, but you know what I mean. No, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In terms of in terms of what this country's elected leaders are giving to certain demographics of people mm-hmm. is unacceptable, man. Yeah. And the same shit's happening in New York. It's happening everywhere. But um, the one thing about New Orleans is that there's a New Orleans within a New Orleans. And mm-hmm. if you're accepted into that, then um, it's the most beautiful place in the world. Yeah. Well, that's like the heartbeat, right? That's like... Yeah. The Mardi Gras Indian culture yeah. is... Yeah. Um, I love that. About- I mean, i only been to New Orleans once, but... <clears throat> that's what made me kind of go there for that. I want to see, I want to like lay eyes on that. And when I did see it, I loved it, man. I just, I mean, and I'm Creole too. So I'm, I'm Creole, but different Creole. And I always had this like affinity with this connection with new Orleans Creole people. Um, just because they're like the second stop on the boat, you know what I'm saying? So to yeah. speak. And uh, when I went to New Orleans, I mean, I see so many people there. They look like my family. And I have a few friends that are from New Orleans, born and bred. And they used to say, Danny looked like he's from New Orleans until he opens his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can actually hear that coming out of his mouth. Yo, too. Buzz, you yeah, say that all the time. Yeah. Danny no. looked like he's from New Orleans. As soon as he opened up his mouth, man. I'm like, yo, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, man. Hey, man First generation Islander that. born in the Northeast, man. What do you want me to do? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm a coconut born in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, man. New Bedford, represent, bro. That's what it is. But I love what New Orleans. What you know about New, New Bedford? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but New Orleans is a great it. city, man. I mean, the music there, I, I mean, I was in love with it when I was there. I loved it, man. It was just, yeah, the energy there was amazing. Yeah, when, you, when you know the right spots to go and hang, I mean, like, I get to see George Porter Jr. play at the Maple Leaf every Monday night. Usually there's like 10 or 20 people there. Eh, no big deal. Uh-huh. And he's like uh-huh. playing with his trio where they're just doing shit, you know, off the top of the dome. They'll play, you know, tunes they all know, you know, but it's really like his workshop for writing tunes, what you realize. And to see someone like George Porter Jr. It's even cooler. <laughs> like cool. Stuff like that will never get old to me. Yeah, right, right, right. I've probably been to like 100 at this point. You know, it's like... <laughs> Well, you guys also have uh, uh, the Massachusetts thing in common, too, right? Oh, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I lived in Boston for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you lived in Boston? Yeah, man. Yeah, I lived in Boston for 10 years. Oh, wow. Oh, crazy. Yeah. What would you so, think of Boston? You know, I was... Boston's kind of weird, right? Kind of weird city. Yeah, man. You know, honestly, I don't like Boston. No, me neither. It's like the most, and, it's like the I, most segregated no, no, city in the Northeast. Let me, let me preface that because I have, I have like my sister lives in Boston. <laughs> I have many dear friends that live in Boston and some of the best years of my life are because of Boston. Yes, I agreed. So let, let's, you know, don't take that without a grain of salt. What it, what it was for me personally is that I didn't like it for me mm-hmm. because I needed to go to New York. Mm-hmm. And I needed to, you know, there, you know, once you're in Boston, you play the same six clubs 200 times each. There's a ceiling. It's a great place to go to school. There is a ceiling there. But when you get out there as a professional musician, you know, there's like five or six places to play, man. Yeah. And once you do ceiling, that, you realize sure. that there, there's a ceiling on that. Yeah. And I never really toured. I mean, I did like a couple little runs here and there, you know, with uh, some Senegalese artists. Um, back then but um when i really started touring is when i got to new york yeah of course and Mm -hmm. i needed to go on the road i needed to go see the world i needed to you know spread my wings you know as they say so um there was only one place for that and i i still believe there is still only one place for that although new orleans a lot of touring acts are coming out of here now la obviously you know stuff like that so you know new york's always at the heart of what i do I guess. Yeah. Well, New New York and New Orleans are also like the whetstone that you sharpen the blade on because mm-hmm. New Orleans is like one of the last places in the country where a musician can actually make a living. 
You know, whereas yeah. like New York, it's, it's like, oh, I'm going to be playing seven nights a week for 50 bucks a night and doing four hour sets. Yeah. Is that crazy? That is a great point that you bring up, my man. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. insane. You know, I think New Orleans, I think in Austin, you can still do it. Nashville, you can do it. Those are all working towns, working musician towns. But, but even even those two are nothing in comparison to New Orleans in the sense that, you know, the entire economic structure of this province or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. is based on music. And so, you know, clubs are going 24-7, seven days a week. Um, at every club, there's maybe uh, five or six time slots that bands are just filled in all day, every day. So... You know, it's um, that was that was definitely a big thing for me, because when I was getting off the road, you know, I, I was doing recording sessions and stuff like that. But like, you know, in New York, I wasn't oh, man. like how many times like you make seven bucks. Like, I think the last new blue gig I did, you know, it was, it was a late night on a Tuesday anyway. And I called way too big of a band. So I guess most of it's on me, but you know, it's like we made seven bucks each and like, that's not a good feeling handing that to musicians that you respect. And like the, the economic reality is like, yeah, we're going to get what we get at the door and it ain't going to be nothing to write home about. That's what you call boots on the ground. But like, you know, in New York, it's more of a pay it forward thing. You know, it's like you play all these shitty gigs all, you know, all over town and all uh, for that one big gig that comes your way. Well, it's like what you were saying about the Harry Belafonte gig. If you wouldn't have been grinding all those times, then years later, you're going to pop up in their head and be like, yo, I remember this cat from New York that I know. Yeah, that's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for sure. They're very similar in that way. New York is a very small town to me. Yeah, it is. And most people think I'm crazy when I say that, but like... It is small town. It is small. When you're dealing with specific industry, it's small. Right, because, you know, you walk down the street, every subway train you get on, you're going to run into someone you know. It's, yes. like, amazing mm -hmm. how often that happens. It always used to blow my mind. still does. But, yeah, it's true. It is true. But, you know, New York, it, you know, has the, has the industry part of it. And it's definitely coming up a lot in New Orleans. Um, the industry is definitely, you know, uh, taking root here more, you know, more than it has in the past, I would say. Although, you know, there's always been famous musicians from New Orleans and all that stuff. You know, But right. when it comes to, like, industry on, like, a very, you know... Yeah, like the industry, industry level. Yeah. <clears throat> and as much as New York has changed, man, it's like... You know it's always going to come back because historically it's like yeah. New York has yeah. always changed very rapidly and very, you know. It's in waves, man. It's in waves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know that you know that's coming back. Yeah. Well, what do you think right now? Because New York to me right now, in the last few years, I have seen it do a switch over. I mean, the pancake has definitely been flipped. And <clears throat> it's like on some other shit right now. And it's definitely not my shit. Right. So I'm wondering how long is it going to be before that shit gets flipped over back to my shit again <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know what happens in new york is happening everywhere in the world no doubt i mm -hmm. i have realized that since before i used to complain about this and it was not the case i didn't realize the whole extent of it but you're right it, it's happening everywhere it's not just specific to that city right but when it happens in new york it's amplified by a hundred million yeah a hundred yeah you know, so it's happening here in New Orleans. I see it every day. And people like be complaining like, oh, rents are rising and da da da. da. I'm like, I've seen that before. Yeah. You know, yep. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> old, old news. Yeah. This yeah. ain't my so first think, rodeo. Yeah. I think, I think what's happening, and this is really getting to the whole crust of the situation, especially with this pandemic and a lot of people going introspectively and thinking about life at large and, you know, and all this stuff. Um, the world's at a, at a turning point. I really do believe that the world is at a turning point and there's only one way to go. And I think, you know, as horrific and terrible as this, you know, motherfucker of a disease or a, a cold or I don't know what even you call it. COVID-19 is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so many people have died. So many people are suffering economically, literally losing their lives physically, you know, whatever. Um, but it has forced the world to grind to a halt and take a deep fucking breath. And that's on us to use that as an opportunity to address these things that we're talking about in microcosms like, oh, you know, New York is changing and New Orleans is changing too and this and that and blah, blah, blah. There's something bigger. When there's a problem, you have to go to the root of the problem. 
course. And the root of the problem is that they're robbing us fucking blind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are we gonna, are we gonna walk through this door? From me, man. Taxi. Are we gonna walk through Taxi. this door? <laughs> so, you get no you know, argument from, from me. <laughs> yes. Now, now listen. Now listen. They've always been robbing us blind, and there'll always be a certain amount of that too. However, it's gotten so, the the economic gap between the rich and the poor has gotten so yeah, exponentially sure. in a much shorter time that the veil has been taken off this motherfucker with this pandemic. Yeah. The veil of America of like, you know, stand up, say the national anthem, da da la, because I believe in da da la la. It's like, no, we are all human beings. Doesn't matter what country, what city, how rich, how poor, we are all the fucking same. And I think a lot of people are realizing that along with other things like climate change and all this stuff. So for me now, even though this is a horrific time, I can't play shows, you know, like all this stuff. Well, yeah, these are small problems next to other people's problems. As a musician, we are trained every fucking day. We do this. We do this because we love it, but it makes no sense financially, logically, whatever. <laughs> it makes no sense. Like one of one of my teachers used to say, he's like, I was like, how do you make money? You know, he's like, you look like you have money. He's like, you want to make money? Be a doctor. You know, and that's true. When you do music, you really got to love it and all this stuff. But what it trains you to do is any catastrophe that happens in your life, any disaster, any financial, otherwise, whatever. You get robbed, your van breaks down in the countryside of France with no, with your cell phone on 3% battery, you know, whatever. <laughs> Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs> yeah, what it, what it trains you to do is that whenever there's a catastrophe, whenever there's, there's a disaster, that is an opportunity to turn water into wine, man. That's what you got to do mm-hmm. yeah. with every situation. You can sit there and wallow in every bad thing, or yeah. you can start to be proactive in figuring out your own, al- yeah. per, your own personal alchemy and get it going, motherfucker. <laughs> exactly. And so so with it, with this situation we find ourselves in now, I can only look at it as an opportunity. Yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. and the opportunity exactly. is that we don't have to live like we used to live. Right. This is proving that, you know, if resources are allocated across the board without discrimination, we see just a little window because there's a lot of di- discrimination with this shit right now. Yeah. But yeah. You see enough of a little slit of light coming through your window that you're like, oh, we really don't have to live like that. Well, that's the thing, right? You always got to look to the light. Right. Even if it's just that little sliver, man, you just got to embrace that light. That's it. Right. That's the only thing you can do, man. Or else you just, if you want to stay in that darkness and just stay down there and just get depressed and blah, 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 that's, you're just going to stay stagnant. You know, exactly. You, Absolutely. But if you stop swimming, like, I can't. swimming, man. Like you were saying before, yes, the situation is not ideal. Yes, the situation sucks. Guess what touring teaches you? Yes, the situation is not ideal. Yes, the situation sucks. But you can either accept that it sucks and everything comes to an end sooner or later. I'm hoping that this situation wakes a lot of people up that necessarily doesn't affect so much it it affects everybody let me let me start by saying that it affects everybody but economically it doesn't necessarily affect everybody as much right. as a lot of people you know people that exactly. work people that live in check to check and they don't have nothing now they can't even go to work and and, right. and, and unemployment didn't kick in for them and they're just stuck and they're like what the fuck you know like it's crazy i can't even imagine you know what i mean or so, somehow the information on how to get unemployment didn't make it to their neighborhood. Right. Right. Exactly. Funny how that works. Right. Or the websites are crashing. You know, like that too. Yeah. You know. Man, they're running the yo state unemployments. Man, are running off like Apple IIe's from like '93. Man, I'm like, mm-hmm. where is our tax money going? Yeah. And I know. furthermore, it's like all you need to do, whoever listen, whoever does that Amazon website. Call them immediately. Yeah, I know. Because exactly. that shit never and, crashes. And make them do that. <laughs> Like, that shit never crashes, man. Like, you'll have your money the next day. <laughs> they need to get Amazon and Pornhub servers, and Seriously, nothing will ever Amazon crash. Amazon and Pornhub. <laughs> Says a lot about America, doesn't it? <laughs> Says a lot about America, For real, it? though. Seriously. Yeah. Amazon servers actually get rented by the Pentagon. 
Really? Like Amazon built servers to host just the Pentagon. Well, because Bezos signed that six hundred million dollar deal with the CIA. Oh right. Ah. So part of that was Amazon would build the servers for the Pentagon. It's kind of embarrassing. You would it's think in- that the government would have the best of the best, best shit. You know, they'd be like, don't fuck with us, man. We run everything. Check us out. But they don't really run everything. You know, you already know that our tax money doesn't go where all of it doesn't go where it needs to go. No, I'm sorry. If, I mean, you, if, you, want, if you want clean roads, <laughs> if you want clean roads, man, people need jobs and you got to pay them a living wage. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, it's basically like these algorithms that they're paying people unemployment and stuff are based on a living wage, you know? Yeah. And it is interesting on how so many people now. For the very first time, there's a lot of people that are actually realizing how much they're getting the shaft. Yeah. People that are working at McDonald's right now are fucking national heroes, man. You know? I mean, I haven't read anything about it, but like, I don't, I would assume that they're not getting a pay raise for risking their lives to feed people. You know what? And then there's other industries that are getting hazard pay on top of their pay. And it's it's not like uh, medical workers or any of those people. Like this is regular people who are getting hazard pay, but it's very, very, very select, which sucks. It's like, no, no, no. If you have to be out there interacting with people and putting yourself in a certain state of risk, like... It seems like that would kind of go across the board, but it well, doesn't work like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, know? listen, man, if anyone still has a job right now and has to deal with the public in any capacity, be it a mailman, a McDonald's worker, a nurse, a doctor, whatever, garbage man, they need to be paid triple. Now, on top of that, my sister has kids, and now people are starting to realize a teacher's worth. You got to pay. Oh, yeah. We got to homeschool our kids every day. People like garbage men, teachers. I don't know. Like some garbage companies are privately owned and they're millionaires. I don't know. But but you know what I mean? It's like there is so much industry, including musicians, you know, standard pay of like, hey, I made 150 bucks. Da, da, da. That's so fucking outdated, man. That right. 150 bucks needs to be 300. And, yeah. you know, and then you're talking about a living wage. You know, where it's like, oh, the cost of my light bill and my phone bill is now equitable to the job I'm doing. Because right now it's not. And people are literally going right. into debt trying to pay their phone bill because their phone is their only lifeline. Yeah, it's their only only connection to anything. Yeah, even before the pandemic. So, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. p- give up the money, motherfuckers. It's time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy how right... Just prior to this, that whole conversation of the universal uh, basic income and blah, 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 Yeah, blah. the UBI and everything. Yeah, and a lot of people are kind of like, ah, oh, that's crazy. That'll never happen. But now everybody wants that shit. Right. They just did another thing called the ABC or the the, the ABC Act, which they're, they're talking about, which is basically um, it's a $2,000 upfront payment. Like, you know, it, it, they're trying to fold this into the stimulus. Stimulus, but um, it's a two thousand dollar payment, and then one thousand dollars a month, every month until like this is over. Wow! Right. So yeah. it's like I mean that would help a the, lot of people. It's it's not full on UBI, but it's very it's very very close and very and getting it to it. And well, it's a way, UBI with a time restriction. Right. Exactly. But that's good. But you, I think that you know, works. You know how this country goes. That, so I'm like, I, I remember I read an article about it today and was like, oh, they're testing. Now we're in beta beta mode. Well, right I yeah, hope yeah. they are. Like they're going to kind I of hope test they it are. because, you know. I hope they are because, you know, um, you know, you, you combine that with uh, economic injustice, i.e. institutionalized racism. Yeah. And you have, like I said, people here in New Orleans or in the Bronx or wherever. You got people living in subhuman conditions in the richest country in the world. Yeah, it's crazy. Man. I'm not asking mm-hmm. for a handout. I work for my damn shit every day of the week. I would never have it any other way, man. But yeah, America's got some shit going on here. <laughs> the, you know, the veil has mm-hmm. been taken off with this pandemic. You know, this is one of the opportunities, you know, quote unquote. But it's like. 
now people are starting to realize, like, for instance, do you know that small business bailout, bullshit bailout that uh, the so-called president uh, made and all this stuff? Sorry, Billy, I said I wouldn't talk about politics, but, you know, <laughs> I had to throw one in. But, but basically, basically, you know, you can, you can edit that out later. We're not talking no, about politics. No, We're but, talking about current affairs, man. What, it's just life. <clears throat> what I'm getting at I'm is I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm not even editing this podcast. It's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Classic Billy Polo style. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, no, no, no. So, just go ahead. Do it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have a few people over later. Is that okay? <laughs> That's a story we'll tell you later, Dan. Uh, but basically, like, this uh, small business bailout quote unquote, that they gave, that they passed through Congress and all this stuff and they gave out. What's gone in like three days because they gave all of it like $25 million a pop to all these huge corporations when it's supposed to go to like barbershops and fucking nail salons and movie Mm -hmm. theaters and nightclubs and bars and shit, right? That shit was gone in three days because they, you know, wink, wink, we're going to help our buddies and get us reelected, blah, blah, all this stuff. They did a math equation on that. The amount of money that was in that small business bailout, if you divided it, and I heard this, I mean, fact check it, uh, please. But, you know, basically, if you divided that among every household in America, not every individual, but like every household, you would get something like $3,000 for every household in America. That's how much money it was. And we didn't get that. Did you get that? Did you get the stimulus? I just got the stimulus. I didn't get it yet. I just got it. I just got it. And, you know, I'm never going to turn down money. <laughs> but I'm sorry, $1,200 ain't going to cut it for someone with three no, kids. No, of course not. For You know, I'm lucky. I, I'm single and I live alone and, you know, all this stuff. But it's like. Um, but I'm still waiting for it, though. Come on, man. I need to pay these bills. How, how many kids you got, Danny? I got two children. It's, you a, know? it's a shame and a sin, man. It's a shame and a sin. That really pisses me off, man, that I would get it before you. And I need it. You can PayPal me. You want that money? You can PayPal me. <laughs> All right. No more politics. Refresh the glass. Let's go. <laughs> Refresh the glass. I'm going to go grab another beer. I will be right back. You guys can talk amongst Ooh, yourselves. Oh, I can grab a beer. Right. I'll do it, too. <laughs> Yo, but we have to make a plan, though. Once everything goes back to normal at some point and you are in New York, you are coming to the shop. Yeah, and we'll do this proper. Yes. Cheers, motherfuckers. Yes. Put your glasses up. <laughs> ah. So the last time you two guys were together was at a recording session that I called. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, I was nervous as fuck. Yo, I'm not going to lie. I was scared of Raja that di- I was scared of Raja that night. Why? <laughs> I was scared of you. <laughs> I, I, I've actually, yo, I was super nervous of doing the, the session with you, man. I was like, man. Billy was like, yo, you're going to, because he, he tricked me. He was like, yo, I need you to come me? by. Yeah, he was like, yeah, I need you to come by and do some guitar and this stuff. And I was like, ah, right, cool, man. I'm just thinking that it's like, it's a regular night, man. I'm going to smoke some. <laughs> I'm gonna totally smoke a giant. I'm gonna uh, a couple splits. Fuck I'm yeah. have a couple rums. I'm gonna be just me, me and Bill. We're gonna be talking shit to 3 a.m. like we always do, man. We just always do that shit. That's what I magic get there. Happened. I get there. I see Josh. I see you. I was like, oh my lord, what is happening right now? I was like, what is this? That means you're I went ready, up to man. Bill, and I know Bill. When when Bill's when when you when you start to come up and you start to question Bill, and he does these dances and just like leaves. Right. And you're like, I'm asking you a question, motherfucker, and he's not answering you? Yeah. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, what is happening? So I didn't know. I wasn't clear if you guys were ending a session and you were about to clear out or if I was walking into this new thing I was going to be doing. <laughs> Apparently, I was walking into a new thing that I was doing with you guys. And I had, I, I, I had never hung out with you at that time. That I was know. It. Like, it was like my first know introduction. Each other. But that, yeah, so I'm going like, to be real with you. That's I was actually terrified of you, too, because Billy, like every time I'm in, you know, I guess like me and Billy had started, I guess we were working on my album or something. Like we had started working fairly recently. You know, we like we were qu- quick friends, but like, mm-hmm. you know, and like I heard the records, and I was like, oh shit, man! And so like that's the that's, that's hilarious. the hilarious thing is I was eat and like I'm <laughs> really kind of shy if I don't know people. Like like I said, like I don't even like FaceTiming people because I'm like, oh, that's 
Terrifying. That's funny. I w- <laughs> Yo, I'm not gonna lie. I was so, I was so, I was like shit in my pants, dude. And I'm like, oh my god, Bill, you gonna make me do this fucking thing in front of this guy? I'm like, oh my god, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm like, so I'm, I'm like, like, no, man, it's fine, it's cool. Just so I'm do sitting there, I'm sweat, I'm, I'm starting to sweat bullets. I'm literally in the live, not in the live room, in the um, in the uh, mixing room, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, oh my god, I'm starting to sweat. And I'm like, oh my lord, what is happening right now? And then I'm like, how? I'm starting to think of how can I get out of this. So I'm like, can I? Can I fake that I have to go home? Can I like? Can I just like bounce? You know what I'm saying? Oh, shit, was and that I'm, what happened? And this is going against my constitution. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not like that. But I'm like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so I come over to Bill. I'm like, I'm like badgering him. So I'm like, hey, hey, what's what's the chords, dude? I don't even know the chords. And Bill's like, you got this. And I'm like, I don't got this. I don't have this, dude. Maybe you can't tell. I do not have this. <laughs> So thank God Josh, uh, Josh is there, and that's you know that's brother from back back in the day, back in the day, and he's like, hey man, you got this, and I'm like, I don't know, I don't think so. And he's like, no, nah, you'll be fine, man, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And I'm like, oh fucking hey, jo- please just murder me right now. I'd be so much more happy if I was dead. Oh. And we go into the live room. <laughs> Jim was running the board, I think. Yeah, yeah, time. even worse. Jim is running the board. He's a, he's he's a bottle of rye deep. He's telling me I look good. I'm like, I don't look good. I'm I'm nervous as fuck. So I go in there and you 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 come up to me, Bill, and you're like, you give me this like, you make me sweat for like 45 minutes, and then you come over and you're like, it's like D to G, and then it goes to C to G, and I'm like, what what? And then you walk away, and I'm like, hey, what? What? <laughs> Let me write that I'm like, down. fuck, man. So I'm just sitting there, and for some reason, by the by the light of God, I got, I just, I got it for some reason. I'm like, Funny how that boom! works. I'm there with it. I'm watching your hands. I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> if oh I man, I apologize oh, in advance. Jesus Christ, man. That was uh, that was a pretty intense moment for me. Oh man, but I, I mean, I, you know, like I know. <laughs> that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. That happens to me every fucking day, man. <laughs> like, That's good to hear. That's reassuring to hear. I, I love mean, hearing that because I mean, no, for real, man. It's like if you if you actually realize, I mean, you could think of like the baddest motherfucker out there, like I don't know, Richard Bono on bass or whoever. It's like I guarantee you, like music, the funny thing about being creative and being a musician and you know is that it involves emotions and feeling. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, he could literally play like some stuff like jocko s stuff like masterpiece and just be like oh man that that fourth note i hit man it was just <laughs> i don't have what it takes no more <laughs> like you know come on man this is normal shit man but yeah just so you know i was equally as terrified as you because i'm like oh, nice if i told you what the chords were i'm just adding something to what you would be thinking about it's true on top of what you're thinking about that was a really fun session after i got past my 45 minutes of panic that yeah, was well, one of my know, favorite I, sessions of all time. I, of all the sessions I've done, that's in the top three. That, yeah, man. That was a good one. Do you have a recording of this? Like, is that out there? Oh, yeah. That session man. is uh, Classy Time on the Morgan album. Oh, mm-hmm. shit. Yeah, I, I definitely. That that was from that? Yeah. But we have more. Wow. There's more. And then we did Easter Rock. Yes, we did that. And Easter yes. Rock is the one that Josh was like, God damn it, Billy. If it yes. was anybody else, I'd ask for charts. But I know you ain't got no charts. <laughs> <laughs> What's with this break? It was that turnaround, too. The turnaround. I was like, I know, Bill. Bill be fucking everybody up with this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. I remember, like, hey, Roger, what are you doing today? Oh, I got this gig. I got to go to this rehearsal. And then I got a gig tonight. And I'm like, you got some time to come over to the shop and just, like, cut a quick guitar line? Like, nothing to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. I'll swing by. He <laughs> cuts the guitar line. He's like, what is this for? I was like, oh, this is a tune with Johnny Osborne. He's like, what the <laughs> fuck, man? Why didn't you tell me that before we started playing? No, Billy, Billy. I'm looking at you, motherfucker. I am still livid at you for that. <laughs> livid. Not cool at all. Cause I, man, I remember. I remember that shit. I remember that shit like it was yesterday. I was like, I was like, oh yeah, cool. Another Billy Rhythm. Cool. You know, like I'll just fucking you know vibe on it. We'll work it out later. <laughs> Next thing I know. Whatever the hell bullshit I played for whatever is like <laughs> is on a track with one of my favorite singers of all time. 
there was another version that we did from the archive tapes. What are you doing today? Did, you know, just swing by the shop and like play the shit. He gets there and I start playing the track and he eyes blow up and he looks at me. He's like, yo, what is this? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's this Whalers tune that I had Kendra Morris sing. Another he's like, one. wait, 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 what? No, no, nah, not cool at all. You're like, yeah. I was like, that was really Carly Barrett. You're like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> yo, the other time, I, were you there, Danny? I'm not sure. When you called me to the studio, it was, it was, I remember this much. I don't remember uh -oh. everything. <laughs> I remember this much. It was a brick ass winter night, February in Brooklyn. Sounds like New York. One of those nights you walk outside for three seconds and you are, you are praying for death. It yeah. was and of, that of course, cold. that's the night I'm doing a session. I have every single thing. And, you know, yeah. Put this in perspective. I was, at the time, I was going through this like worst breakups of my life. You know, it's like uh, cry me a fucking river shit. You know, but anyway, I was I was depressed. <laughs> you know, so I was like, any you know, call me at two in the morning on a, a Tuesday night in Brooklyn. Yeah, man, I'm ready to go out. You know, whatever. And uh, <laughs> had to get out. And so <clears throat> he's like, just come to the studio. I was like, what? What are we gonna do? What are we doing? <laughs> He's There's like, always something just, to do. Trust me. Bill's an open book, man. You know, just go there. You come out with 10 songs. Bro, cla classic Billy line. Just trust me. I was like. <laughs> yes, that sounds like I was like, like <laughs> well, I know it's not just like some bullshit, but still maybe it could be. And I would be really mad if it was. But all right, fine. Uh, fuck it. I I'll go down. I walk into the fucking room and it's Clive Chin and Family Man Barrett. <laughs> and if anyone knows me, knows that my heart beats in Family Man's bass line. That's yeah. like, <laughs> like, I mean, this is like a guy to me that is a mythical figure. Like he's yeah. not even human to me. Like that's how, like how much esteem mm. I have for, yeah. you know. And for, pe for people at you, home that don't know, Family Man Barrett, bass player for the Whalers, Bob Marley, we gotta, you know, not every listener right. knows who we're talking about here. We get into our thing. Right. Everybody knows who we're talking about. But Family Man Barrett from the Whalers, Bob Marley. One, Continue with and, this. I would, and, yeah, right. Clive Chin of Randy's Records, one of the 70s, 60s, 70s. Yes. Golden era reggae recording. stuff. Hits for, and Clive, hits for a millennium. Clive is somebody Roger could call on speed dial right now. And <laughs> Roger. <laughs> yeah. Roger. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I get like at least fifteen Rogers before I turn into Raja, and that's just that, oh, that, that, that goes for everybody in life. <laughs> that's so crazy. I think it's a Caribbean thing though, because they put R's where they don't belong, yeah. and they put H's where they don't. Oh yeah, belong. no, 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 Clive, you Clive, know. Clive well, got you know, my stuff In Massachusetts, right away. you would definitely in Massachusetts probably everybody thought you were Roger, but they just called you Raja. No, that's a big. That's probably where my deep seated hate of Boston comes in. <laughs> really? What do you mean? Why? Because what? listen, here's my name. What's your name? Raja. Now, if you say Roger with a Massachusetts accent, Raja. Yeah. Same shit. So I'm Raja. Okay. But yeah. I'm Raja. That's why I'm saying. That's what I thought. Oh my God. I, <laughs> this is some deep seated trauma, man. It's a no brainer with me. And it's got nothing to do with the great people of Boston. And, you know, like, like I said, Boston's given me so much in my life, man. I owe a lot to that city. But how do they fuck it up, though? Man, I couldn't deal. I think that's what it was. I couldn't deal with the fact that no one would get my name, man. But how could they not deal with it, though? I don't understand. I mean, it's, you know, it's, obviously it's, some people, it, it basically, here's my rule. All right. And this goes for no matter any city that I'm in. If I want to talk to you, I will correct you. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and if I don't want to talk to you, I'm Roger. <laughs> but my point with Massachusetts was that you could be Raja or Roger, and it's going to be pronounced the same way. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. And there's not there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a thing. It's just like it sucks when you could be Roger and people are going to say Raja. Right. I mean, like, I can't tell you how many times I've been on stage where people like that. I've been playing in a band with for like over a year. Like, hey, this is Roger. I'm like, oh, oh, fuck. Oh, OK. But I was a very I was a very shy guy. So, you know. I remember that day calling you. And oh, was, fam definitely didn't get my name. Was, he, he was like, oh, cool, Roger. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's who I am. That's it. whatever you want to call me, sir. Whatever. <laughs> You're no, like, I'm good with it. Fine. Family, you heard it here first. 
the tiger pit. <laughs> you heard it here first. The only person in this world that I'm cool with call, fucking up my name or calling me a different name or whatever is Aston Family Man Ferris. <laughs> Everybody else Yo, that... can go fuck themselves. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you know, there was so many like crazy elements of that whole day. Mm. But um I, I just... would have left. I wouldn't even have played that. I would have been like, no. no, this is this <laughs> no, is a man, great like, story. I would have been like, Bill, fuck great... you, man. Fuck you. <laughs> Danny, 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 this is a great story. I called like a couple people. It actually was kind of more like a hang than anything because... 100%. You knew Clive at that point. Like, Clive and fams used to hang out every Sunday at, back at Randy's and just the way that we used to hang out at the kennel the same way, you know? That's why Clive loved the studio because he's, he was like, this reminds me of being at Randy's. That, this that's is the quite same a shit that was going on at Randy's. That's quite a compliment, wow, man. Easy, man. So, like, these two walk into the studio, and I'm like, oh, shit. Like, Raja, yo, just get here now. Like, I don't care what you're doing. Just get here. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is another part of that story. You know, there's certain things in your life that, you know, you'll never forget. This night, what was so crazy for people out there that don't know, is that what Billy was working on with Clive at that time <laughs> was literally digitizing about 3,000 reels from the old Randy's studio that had never been released, but to... You know, they were all on tape reels that had gone through hurricanes and storms and mildew and this and that. And, yeah. you know, this is his like legit historic Smithsonian type yeah. audio footage of some of the greatest bands and artists and session people in Jamaican music history. So Billy was working on these reels and digitizing them and preserving them. And that was like painstaking work. He was knee deep in some of the most historic <laughs> reels. You know, like every time I'd come in to do a session for my album at that time, Billy would surprise me every day with some fucking gem where he would hand me this box, which was containing a reel. He would just hand it to me and it would say like Dennis Brown, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> 1973. Like, what? Like, this is just Dennis Brown hanging out in a studio? Like... You know, trying trying a certain take on an idea they had. Holy shit. It's so, weird, right? It's like time travel, dude. Right. So this is the context of this story. And but that so, was only I would I would only call certain people around for that <laughs> shit. I was getting phone calls and emails from people I would never expect. Well listen, <laughs> listen. Y'all prepared? Oh. I couldn't tell what you were doing. We need to smoke for um for this right. story. Just one hit. We'll keep it PG. Oh, yeah. So basically, Billy calls me into the studio. I don't know if Fams is going to be there. So anyway, I don't know this. I walk into the studio, and of course, I'm just like, Danny, you want to talk about you being nervous? <laughs> Bro, I, 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 my name is Roger. My name is Roger. You know, because I wanted to make it easy on him. <laughs> <laughs> and Fam wanna... sounds like a bass when he talks. I that man I... is a bass. He just emanates low end. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. For real, for real. God. What was so crazy is that his whole body, his whole spirit, everything that emanated from this being was 100% bass. I mean, even if you didn't know anything about music or different instruments or whatever, if you passed mm -hmm. this man in the street, you'd be like, bass. Yeah. <laughs> You would you yep. would know bass if you didn't know it before. It was just remarkable meeting one of my heroes like that. Anyway, the point of this story, and this is why we smoked that herb, is mm -hmm. some point during the night, there we are, you know, we're just hanging, you know, and like we go off in the corner and we're smoking weed and you know, all the stuff. And eventually, Billy, like the true asshole he is, decides <laughs> to pull out an original whaler's reel and he puts it on the board. And there I am, high as hell, with Clive Chin. And my hero, as a guitar player, my hero, a bass player, uh -huh. is... Sitting there looking at you. No, not sitting there. Like, we're just, like, walking around, like, stumbling into each other because we're high as hell. I mean, like, chalice high. You know what I'm saying? Like, really high. And Billy presses a, the solo button on Family Man's brother, Carly Barrett, one of the greatest drummers oh, yeah. in Jamaican music history. I'll never forget this, Billy. 
This he was pre- so he puts, heavy at yeah, that. He that puts, moment was so heavy. Billy sitting down at the chair at the board. We're standing like three in a line behind him with our arms folded like, yeah, we're cool musicians kind of shit, whatever. <laughs> and Billy presses solo on Carly Barrett's hi-hat. And it was this moment in time where time just broke. I'm not it's like, like this so is melodic not, you know, for a hi hat. You're like, what the yeah, hell? Ex- like, like, exactly. listen, it's like its own listen, song. <laughs> listen, why I'm saying this is like, you know, a lot of people have catchphrases for this and that. That a lot. Yeah, time stood still and this and that. Da-da-da. No, it I will never forget this for as long as I live. Family man's brother who was murdered. At yeah. the height of his powers, yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. most... Good you know, thing to mention, at the height of his powers. The guy right. behind all the Bob Marley stuff, you know? And I kind of look over at Fams, and Fams is just sitting there, you know, you just see him nod and smile and just... And I said, oh my God. In my own brain, I said... Oh, now you have to play after he just had this moment with his brother. Right. I, I, <laughs> I, I literally, inside my own head, I said, oh my God. He remembers everything about this session. Everything. Yeah. Everything. What the room smells like. What exactly? You know how, I'm feeling how, for you. What the temperature I'm feeling for you was. Right now. <laughs> like all this stuff. Like you literally for two seconds, I literally saw Family Man in that moment, 40, 50 years ago, wherever it, it was. And I would have yep. ran out of that room and left my. I would have been. I would have left my guitar there. But like, fuck it, I'll pick it up in the morning. <laughs> you you just wouldn't know what to do with yourself, just like me. Yeah, and I was. I would have been. Whew. And man, you know, oh man, I you know that's something I will take to the grave, man. There's no way I can describe it in words. It was just I saw it. I saw it on his face. The way he nodded I mean, and you're smiled. You're describing it pretty well. I'm feeling it. He he remembered. He he was with his brother at that time. And it, mm-hmm. you know, man, no matter what circumstance you see that, and I think all of us have experienced that with family members or friends or whatever. But in this context, for me musically, I'm just like, man, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, that's everything amazing. after this, I'm good. That's a good session. That's a good session. Shit, Let man, me uh, you get choked up over something like that. Man. Come on. Just to expound on that, I'm sitting there at the console. Clive to my left. Fams is right behind me. Fams was leaned over to me and he goes, "Can you solo out the drums? I just want to have a moment with my brother." Oh wow! And then that's when I started soloing out everything. And I just remember turning around. I just looked at Fam. He had his eyes closed, and he was not there. He was, Ooh. you know, he was astral traveling. Yeah. How beautiful and, um, is that, though? After we listened to that. Fams goes, can you just bounce me a track of that? Oh, that's Can you just cool. bounce me a track of just the drums? And I remember sitting there thinking, what point from the time when I was born had escalated to this point now where nice. Family Man is asking me for a bounce of his brother playing drums, who his wow. brother is one of the biggest influences on me as a drummer. Right, and you are a drummer. You know, so, yeah, I'm just Sometimes those things are meant to be questioned. Exactly. And at, at, that's funny because I was just going to say, because at that point I was feeling that nervousness and I just let it all go. Yeah. yeah. I never thought as a recording engineer, everybody asks you for bounces and files all the time. I never, <laughs> yeah, me, ever, me ever too. could conceive <laughs> that I would be asked by family man Barrett yeah. to give him a bounce of Carly Barrett's drum track. Yeah. No, that's just, that's so crazy, man. That's a beautiful thing, man. That's a beautiful thing. That's why I made the call because I was like, that moment is meant well, that, to be shared. It's not meant yeah. to be just mine. You know what I'm saying? But that's a beautiful thing on two, on two ends of the spectrum. The fact that you later on in your life, reggae music has brought you to some point in your life where you were able to share that with one of your heroes musically. That's one what's one end of the spectrum. But how beautiful is it for him to sit there and just and hear of an, an audio track of his brother from that time when he was in the room with him and sonically mm-hmm. that to bring his spirit back to connect with him again. That's amazing. I mean, music does that type of shit, and that's beautiful. Yeah, he'd never heard it since he did the session. That much was clear. Yeah, that's you know, crazy. Exactly. That's I mean, like, crazy. And how young, you know how young they were, and like so, it, it shows you the beauty of like like everybody because music, music, music. You hear music. We take music like that because we're musicians. We create the stuff, so we do have a, a magical aspect to the thing that we adhere to. But most people 
how desensitized they are to the importance of music. But when you create music, you know, you're very aware of like the magical components. Right. It's, it really is magic, man. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it is magic. You know, the, yeah. the same way that we were talking about the session we did earlier yeah. is the same way that FAMS is looking back on that session. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, thank God that we're all still here. Yeah. He's, he was listening to somebody who's not here anymore. You know, but probably just... felt so connected when he was listening to it. And just for our non-musician listeners out there, what we're talking about is a brother and brother rhythm sections, yeah. like Blood in, Brothers. In, yeah, <laughs> Blood in, a, Brothers. in a band, in a band. I don't care what style of music. The most important relationship is between the drummer and the bass player. Period. Yeah, and they're brothers. Period. And they are connected <laughs> through blood and genetics and everything. Yeah. The, the ethereal things that happen in music are heightened when siblings actually play together. And yeah. it's not it's not oh, like yeah. um it's not yes. like a theory or 100%. this or that. It's actually like, you know, it's, no, it's like it, no, these people that's, like that's, so imagine real. them as like the like rhythm section and then one gets taken from you on this plane right how can't, good you know, a, i can't imagine yeah and how good a rhythm section is like between the bass and drums is based yeah. on how well they know each other now in musical terms that knowing somebody is knowing them musically what they're going to do next anticipating that and you have great rhythm sections that are not related but they know each other really well, and that's why it sounds really good. And they can anticipate things right. musically that, you know, go there. These are the unspoken things about music. When you know somebody really well and you play with them, like me and Billy, we know each other really well and we play together a lot. They know each other even more because literally since birth, they've been running around in diaper. You know, I mean, the, the levels of that are like fascinating to me. Right. Yeah, oh, I played cool. music with my brothers, man. It, it's it's yeah, a different did. thing. And it's apparent, man. It's crazy. Like you can hear it on you guys, mm -hmm. on them, on on Bill and his brothers, man. Have you ever heard any of their stuff? Like no, this stuff. Like listen, no? man. Oh man, I just learned this about Billy. I had no idea, and uh -huh. I just learned that Josh, Josh Warner, a good friend who's a great bass player that grew up with Billy in Milwaukee and all that. His dad was like in the Denver Symphony or some shit. Josh's dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had no idea. And I found that out actually through the Harry Belafonte gig because the drummer, one of the drummers on the gig was this, uh, an old friend uh, named Sean Dixon, who's a great drummer mm -hmm. and all this stuff. But anyway, after one of these 15 hour long marathon dress rehearsals, yeah. he shared a cab back from the Upper West Side all the way down to Brooklyn to the studio where he needed to go work and cut a track for somebody. On that car ride, you know, we start talking like, oh, yeah, man, we love reggae music and da da da. It's like, yeah, do you know my friend Josh Werner? He's like, huh, yeah, uh, I grew up with him. I was like, what? But like, yeah, we grew up in the same town, went to the same school and shit. And he told me about Josh's dad. And I was like, what? Like, it blew my mind. Yeah, his like, dad's a drummer. Yeah, man. I was like, man, Josh, spill the beans, man. It had to have come from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it really did come from somewhere. I mean, you know, from what I, I mean, I've been friends with Josh since uh, 98, I believe. Wow. Like good friends, yeah. like, you know, we're brothers, you know what I'm saying? That's my homie. Um, I got like, to know him in like 2010 is when we really started. Oh, like, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. That's kind of like when you started. Yeah, when I heard Bill talk about you two for a while, I was like, oh, "Who's this guy, Raja?" <laughs> yeah, eventually, eventually, we're destined to meet. God damn yeah, it! Yeah, no Danny. doubt. But uh, but we are about to, the roller coaster is about to end in like ten seconds. This meeting. So, but let's sign off right now. And yeah. how dope it was that we did this tonight together. Yes. And it was, yeah, man. it's amazing. You know what? I'm so psyched. You know what? I'm so like psyched. Like I said, I hate FaceTime and all those things naturally, but like, it's really good seeing you guys yeah. in, in, in the face. One hundred percent. One hundred. We all got tigers behind us, man. It's great. One hundred percent. I hope the listeners enjoy what we just did right now. And uh, yeah. it was super, super fucking dope. But uh, yeah, we're signing off. Thank you for checking in the Tiger Pit. Yeah, yo, I love you both, man. Dearly. I want to give a special shout out again to Raja Cassis for joining us on this episode. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Take it easy.